Hello my loves, today we're going to look at some more reddit stories and if you've enjoyed a reddit story, why don't you consider hitting the like subscribe button, maybe that's the notification bell too and let's start with today's story. Story, fired from my job but received a year's worth of pay and got my boss fired. This happened in the early 2010s, before the advancement of technology in video editing and content creation. I was hired as a content creator for a university that wanted to leverage social network to kickstart their branding campaign. The pay was low, roughly 2,200 US dollars and in those days, there were not that many video content creators around and the process usually took a long time from start to finish. I was hired and on my second day, my manager presented my KPI of 85 3 to 10 minute videos in 52 weeks which was impossible for a one-man team in those days. This meant I had to do the scripting, producing, casting talents, shooting videos, composing music they were too cheap to pay for a royalty-free music subscription and editing, all of which I had to use my own equipment and software because their cameras and computers were so old, they simply couldn't handle the strain of even doing things in 720p, much less 1080p. I tried to let my manager know, but she just smiled encouragingly, telling me to give it a try, assuring me if the videos were good, the quantity would not be what she focused on. Hearing this, I agreed to give it a try. My manager treated me well in the first month, however, one day when she found out I was a smoker, her attitude changed overnight. A colleague had actually done a facepalm when I told her about it and she let me know that the manager hated smokers and often advocated to get them fired. She started nitpicking me on everything, from smelling like cigarette smoke after my breaks, coming in 5 to 10 minutes late despite doing more than 4 hours of overtime daily, not being contactable during break times, the list goes on. But I soldiered on, because I just wanted to do the work and do it well. Five months in, I was called into the director's office where I saw my manager putting on her best, displeased, but gleeful face and I felt my stomach drop. The director told me that she was disappointed because she had heard that I was falling behind on my work and it was already halfway through the year and I had only completed 30 out of my 85 videos. I tried to explain that I had been working my butt off on these videos, I literally worked 6 days out of the week, over 60 hours just to do what needed to be done and that being a one-man army made things impossible, and also the fact that the videos I had put up grossed the highest views ever on their social network page. I also recounted how my manager said that she was looking for quality videos over quantity. The director dismissed this and stated that the KPI was simply 85 videos in a year and since it was almost half a year and with my numbers at less than half, she felt it prudent to cut the cord early. I asked how would they even meet the KPI if they were to fire me now my manager had snorted, saying we'll find a professional production house to finish your work. The director had given her an odd look but nodded in her support nonetheless, telling me you don't need to worry, manager will get the job done. That was when a light bulb went off in my head. Seeing as I was the content professional in the office, one of my jobs was to keep a database of production houses to use in the event we needed to do a shoot that required more resources, and I was sure that they would be using the production houses in my database as my manager had no contacts in the production industry. So, I changed the contact numbers and messed up all the emails on all of the entries except one. The one, I had a friend working as a junior director not an assistant director, but a director assigned to smaller video projects. I gave him a call and told him of my plan, and sure enough within two days, they were called to come in to pitch. I told him that I had a plan that was a win-win for us. It would instantly help him and put him on the fast track to a director position by bringing in that much business to his production house and it would also benefit me financially. I would teach him exactly how to pitch to win over the boss and the director and in turn, his company would pay me a standard finder's fee of 15%. He agreed instantly and immediately put me on the line with his general manager who upon realizing this was to be 6 months of work for a high 6 digit payout, instantly agreed and drew up a contract. As it turns out, after I gave them a metaphorical step by step playbook they were the perfect fit somehow understanding the needs and style of the university as well as the sort of themes the university wanted to feature. 
The director and my former boss were amazed that my friend's production house was so familiar with their content that they signed them up on the spot. Now, even back then using a production house back then was not cheap. Each video that they produced could cost double to triple my monthly salary given that they had specialized people for each function producer, director, director of photography, gaffer, sound person, video editor, assista production assistants etc., but this meant that they could complete a video every two to three days. So yes, they produced 50 videos in a span of four months for over 100 months of my salary and I sat back and collected the healthy 15% which was about 15 months of my salary. This allowed me to put money aside for a holiday and the rest to further my studies with a respected film school overseas. I thought my plan ended here and I had gotten back at my former bosses, but to my surprise, I received a call from my colleague while I was holidaying in Bali one day. This was the same colleague who had facepalmed when I told her that my manager had found out that I was a smoker. She told me that my former manager had been fired and my director given a massive blasting by the chancellor of the university. The content creation project which I was hired for was only given a budget equating to about a year and a half of my salary and they had exceeded that budget by over 10 times. My former manager was so desperate to ensure that her content creation project could be completed that she had thrown caution to the wind, paying anything to get the job done so that she could show my director that she had completed the project and had approved the massive spend without getting consent from the director. So that is how I got my friend a super fast promotion to a full director in his production house and a year of pay after getting unfairly fired from my job. Story, Landlord put me through three years of hell. My landlord was a terrible human being. Honestly, calling him a human is even pushing it. Just a few things he has done to me over the past three years. Stole my dryer and other household products that are in a common area. Made me pay for a plumbing repair which was deemed normal wear and tear. Tried breaking into my house retaliated against me because I went to my lawyer after he sent me a letter about a parking spot. He tried charging me an extra $150 a month. Mind you, I was never late for rent in three years, except for when he made me pay for the plumbing repair. So the next month I was a couple days late. The list goes on. Now this apartment was nowhere near nice. I found out the plumbing was illegal. He left me with a porch for years that has severe safety issues, the ceiling paint was always falling down, gas heater was not up to code, and so on. I finally got my chance to leave after he wanted to raise my rent $500 a month. He will do anything and everything to get more money out of his tenants. So I called the building inspector for days before I left. I told him everything. The porch when he finally replaced it didn't have a permit and was definitely not up to code. I told him about the plumbing and the heater. I went on and on. The inspector came over the very next day, I saw him taking measurements. Each violation is a $500 day fine until fixed. I honestly don't know what happened, but my god did it feel good to finally get him back. He's at the very least on the town's radar. A week before I moved out he tried telling me I needed to be out at a specific time. I never responded and where I lived, that's not how it works. He tried to threaten me with the police if I wasn't gone. Well, I went to the police myself that morning to warn them. The landlord did come by, threaten me and harass me. I called the police, they informed him I was in the right. Long story short, he had broken into my apartment, I had left to go to storage while I was gone. He nailed my door shut. I told the police to get the supervisor because I was over being harassed by this guy. Go figure he left before the supervisor could get there. I'm positive he knew he'd be arrested on sight. Got the police report, they're charging him with a felony for breaking and entering. Fines plus a charge, don't be a jerk to good people. Story, a lawyer's pro-revenge on a landlord. Landlords are assholes, generally speaking. Everyone knows that. But if you think residential landlords are bad, they're nothing compared to commercial landlords. Landlords of commercial buildings are some of the cruelest, nastiest people I've ever come across. 
This revenge tale is about a commercial landlord and how I dealt with him. Back in the 90s, sometimes I'd go for lunch at this restaurant in the basement of our building. The place was called The Vault because it had a massive bank vault that had always been there, dating back to the days before the place was turned into a restaurant. The vault was so huge that they could seat a couple of tables in there, and you could eat dinner surrounded by rows of old, gleaming safe deposit boxes. One day I was there for lunch, and the owner took me aside. The landlord's driving me nuts, he said. The landlord drives everyone nuts. I was a subtenant in the same building, sharing space with an older lawyer, Aaron, and the landlord was always causing us trouble. I'd already had a few run-ins with him, and we hated each other on sight. In most jurisdictions, commercial landlords don't need court orders to get you out if you're late with the rent. Instead, they just change the locks, and you find out about it when you show up and your key doesn't work. Every time our landlord had a dispute with anyone, which was often, he'd always threaten to change the locks. He keeps demanding all this stuff for extra rent, and it's really weird, because a lot of it's really old. The restaurant owner showed me a letter the landlord had served on him earlier that day. I looked over the demand, and read a list of expenses for snow removal and parking lot repair and common area flooring and all kinds of crap going back years. I read it all the way to the end, and there it was, the usual clause saying he was going to change the locks if the tenant didn't pay this and do that. From the wording of the demand, it looks like you've been fighting a while. Why did you wait before consulting a lawyer? I asked one of the lawyers I know, and he said it's hopeless. He told me the lawyer's name. It was a guy I knew with a shitty real estate practice, who'd resorted to taking little legal aid cases to keep the lights on when the market tanked in 89. You do something to make the landlord hate you. I asked because this is a bit over the top, even for our asshole landlord. He knows I'm moving the restaurant. I think he's trying to grab as much money as possible before I go. Plus he's giving me grief over the vault. He won't let you take it with you. Are you kidding? It weighs almost a hundred tons, and I don't need it. But the lease says I have to remove it, and that I also have to restore the building to what it was before there was a vault. That would cost a fortune. The asshole landlord says if I leave the vault behind when I move, he'll sue. Send your lease up to my office and let me look it over, I said. I finished my lunch and when I got back to my office the lease was waiting for me. It was just as bad as the restaurant owner said. The lease was a renewal of a renewal of an assignment of a renewal the original documents dating back to the shortly after W.W.2 when a bank first leased the place and the vault was installed. Somehow the landlord had suckered the restaurant into taking over a lease that left him liable to remove a bank vault at the end of term. No big deal, I thought, the restaurant can default and all the landlord can do is sue a shell company. But when I got to the last page of the lease, there was a guarantee clause. The restaurant owner had personally guaranteed the lease, and he was on the hook for removing a vault weighing a hundred tons, and then fixing the place up. It would cost a fortune. The case was hopeless, of course, that was obvious right away. But then I thought about the asshole landlord with his demands and his threats and his rent hikes, and I asked my brain to do me a solid, which it promptly did. I picked up the phone and called the restaurant owner. I'm fucked, right? You're calling me to say there's no way out. That's what my commercial lawyer already said. But I just thought I'd ask. I can save you, but it's gonna cost. How much? Five thousand in legals, and another G-note for the agent. Agent. What kind of agent? Real estate. Send up a check, certified, and leave the rest to me. The check hit my desk in less than an hour. I went to Aaron's office. I need a real estate agent, I said. You buying a house? Nope. Selling a house? Nope. By this point I'd been sharing space with Aaron for almost five years, and he knew me pretty well. You pulling one of your stunts again, he asked. Yep. But nothing that will get you into trouble. I know a guy. Aaron knew all kinds of guys 
and that's one of the reasons he eventually got disbarred. But he knew a guy, and he gave me the agent's name and number, and the next day I paid the agent a visit. I told him what I needed, and we agreed to terms. I gave him some papers and the cash for his fee. A few days later I was again at the vault for lunch. The owner saw me walk in and greeted me himself. The landlord's here, he said. Why? For lunch and to be an asshole. Let's sit in the vault room so I don't have to look at his face. He took me to the vault room and with the door almost completely closed, we had a consultation while we ate pasta and drank red wine. We're making demand on the landlord, I said, munching on spaghetti carbonara. Demand, what are we demanding? I pulled a document out of my briefcase and passed it to him while I sipped my wine. We're demanding that the asshole landlord release all the restaurant equipment, all the fixtures. The ovens, the freezers, the ventilation, everything you need to run a restaurant. The lease exempts all that stuff. He can't stop me taking what I want. The only thing that matters is the vault, and of course I don't want that. I shook my head. You need the vault, I said and we're demanding that he release the bank vault as well. We're insisting that he let you take it out within seven business days. You think you can beat the landlord with reverse psychology? You think if you treat him like a two-year-old, you can manipulate him into doing what you want? We'll find out soon enough. He's had the demand for a couple of days now. The restaurant owner dropped his wine glass and it shattered on the marble floor. You already gave it to him, the restaurant owner said. He got up, swung open the vault door and called for the waiter to clean up the mess. Let's see what the landlord has to say, I told him, and we walked over to the landlord's table. The landlord was a big, beefy man with a big appetite. He sat alone, eating a rack of lamb wolfishly with his hands. My client needs an answer today, I said. The landlord looked up at me as he chewed noisily. I'm the vault's lawyer, I said. I gave you a demand the other day. My client needs an answer right now. He needs the vault for a new place, and he's got to make arrangements. Your client can forget about the bank vault, he said, wiping his massive greasy hands on an already soiled napkin. But you can't do that, I said. My shock was feigned, but the restaurant owner's jaw dropped for real. The landlord laughed at us. I'm the landlord. I can do what I want. I'm gonna need that in writing, because my client might sue. I said. Sue all you like, the landlord told me, sue till you're blue in the face. He told me that I'd have a formal response by day's end, and then he told me to go away and let him finish his lunch. When the letter arrived from the landlord, claiming ownership over the bank vault, I brought it downstairs and showed it to my client. How the hell did you do that? Trade secret, I said. The following month the restaurant moved out and the place was empty, and that was too bad, because I had always liked eating at the vault. Now the restaurant was in a new location, 20 minutes away. They called the new place. The vault, and they'd preserve the vibe of the old place. It was very similar, except they didn't have the bank vault. The bank vault, all 100 tons of it, was where it had always been, in the basement of the building where I rented space. I showed up for work a little after that, and Aaron collared me. The landlord's looking for you, he said. Oh yeah. What about? He's really angry. He said his deal fell through. Deal. He was supposed to rent the place downstairs to a new tenant, a bank or a credit union or something like that. They were supposed to come in to sign a lease, but they didn't show up. And what's that got to do with me? I said to Aaron, and I said the same thing again to the landlord when he managed to track me down a couple of days later. I know you were behind this, he said, his jowls quivering, I know it was you. That offer from the agent, it was all bullshit. Just a trick to make me keep the vault, so that your client could sneak out of the place and leave that fucking bank vault behind. I'm gonna sue. If you're looking for counsel, I think I'm going to have to declare a conflict. I'm gonna sue the restaurant, and that agent, and I'm gonna sue you. He stormed off. But the landlord didn't sue. Of course he didn't. 
He didn't have a contract to sue on, only a vague letter of intent that I drafted, enough to hook a greedy landlord who was used to having his way. The offer he'd received was non-binding, incapable of acceptance without the signing of a formal lease, which of course never got signed. When I left Aaron's place a year later, the downstairs was still unoccupied, with a sad for-rent sign sitting in the window, starting to look faded. Story, got rude guy arrested for suspended license. This story takes place about 20 years ago. In the mid-2000s my friends and I would frequent a small billiards place in a neighboring town where you could rent a table by the hour or play per game. We'd play a few games, watch whatever sports were on TV, and have casual conversations. There were no problems and no drama until about three months of us visiting this place. A guy shows and takes our spot at the billiards table. No big deal. We were all chatting anyway. Twenty minutes later my friend lets him know we want to play next game and the jerk is super dismissive. Needless to say, we didn't get in during the next game. So I politely let him know we wanted to play next. Another lady chimed in she wanted the game after us. The guy blatantly ignored me and the other woman. Some more time going by and the guy leave the table. We see our chance to get in. We put the quarters in and the balls are dispensed except the green six ball. The guy took it to the bathroom with him. At this point it was ridiculous and we notified the manager. The manager noted it was 12.30 and they were going to be calling last call and closing so he didn't want to make a scene by kicking him out. He gets us another ball so we can play. The guy comes out of the bathroom and knows we realized what he did. He smirks and proceeds to the patio to have a cigarette, bringing along his beer and the green billiard ball. The guy comes back in and tossed the ball he was holding onto the table, hitting a few balls on the table and messing up our game. He goes up to the bar just in time for last call. One of the friends I was with suggested we follow him home and each call the highway patrol to report a suspected drunk driver. Three of four of us agree. So when he leaves we used our trusty Nextel push-to-talk phones and coordinated several calls to the police. We provided details like license plate, vehicle, make and model and color, and mentioned the car nearly hit another vehicle, was swerving between lines and driving erratically. This was under a 15-minute plan. We had no idea where the guy lived, but suspected it was close as he was visiting a neighborhood place so our time was limited. The one guy who didn't notify the police tailed the jerk and called a skiddy when a police officer pulled between him and the guy and turned in his lights to pull him over. The police blotter that week included an arrested of a guy who was pulled over after multiple calls of erratic driving. He wasn't arrested for DWI, but instead for driving on a suspended license. Story, my landlord got not exactly what he deserved, but it sure was a rough ride for him. I had a landlord who was pretty absent. I lived in this building a high rise, like 20 stories for 10 years. He, despite living next door to me, was absent and cold personally but cool enough. Rent was good, our agreement was never bother him about anything unless it's an absolute emergency. Shower head wonky, go buy a new one. Fridge breaks get it fixed, or do just buy a new one. Take it out of what you pay in rent. Lost the receipt I don't care I know more or less what a fridge costs just take it out of rent finally his wife decides she wants more rent, wants to rent the place out as an office not legal and wants us out ASAP. I agree to move out a month early and get a month's rent back and deposit. Complete 180 on their part. The place is ruined, can't give you shit until you fix all this stuff. Two main things. My cats did scratch up the leather legs of the dining table, and the pull-up bar made two dents in the doorframe of the kitchen, which was quite nice hardwood. They come to me with this list of tons of stuff like oh you hang a photo frame here, this tile is slightly chipped. This is the busiest work time of the year for me, but I'm trying to be cooperative, sure, I got the table legs re-leathered, spackle the photo frame wall hole. Can't do anything about the doorframe, take it out of deposit. Patch the tile. Like dozens of little everyday wear and tear things, like you want me to change the window screens, these are all new screens and in nicer shape than when I moved in. But I did them all, I trusted the guy. 
Gotta get my money at the end, he should have been giving me 24k RMB, 2,500 pounds. He gave me 5. I still need to use the money to fix all that stuff, if you can't accept the 5, I can't give you anything at all. I was super pissed off, but took the 5. Now, people in the building are gossipy. I don't participate, but I did tell this one older lady about my frustration. She told everyone. The wife went from being the star of the mommy's group of the building to nobody wanting to talk to her. People shunned the guy, too. I originally told them I was planning on moving to another city, but an opportunity came up and I ended up renting a similar unit in the same building. So they thought they could just screw me over and not have to see me, but now they still did. Often. A year later the office calls me with some question about how to do something with the floor heating, I go. Door frame is not fixed, still has dents, I call the guy like what the hell, man and he tells me to mind my own business five years later, I see the light at my old place is still on at 3 a.m. Huh, that's odd. I go to check, the door is open, and the place is just trashed, ruined. Cabinets broken, stuff on the walls lazy landlord and the dents on the kitchen door frame are still there. So the guy never fixed anything, just kept my money by this time smartphones were popular and we had a chat group for the whole building, so about 500 people. I took pictures and posted everything. Apparently he had also nicked these people's deposit, and there was a huge ruckus when they trashed the place, cops called. All these people chime in with complaints and pictures. People smoking in the hallways, leaving leaky rubbish outside the front door, videos of people using foul language in front of children, dirty footprints. He got fined a lot for one creating a public disturbance, two degrading the quality of the living space, three illegally renting a residence as an office and to top it off the building management wouldn't grant him permission to have workers in to fix the place, so it sat there empty for like six months. The fines were big, too. Take 1.5 months rent from me, lose a year's rent. Suck it, bro. Story, threaten my friend with revenge porn. I'll ruin your whole damn life. My very good friend made some slightly dumb mistakes and sent some pictures to someone that she reasonably thought she could trust, but not knowing much more than than his first name, his screen name, and roughly where he lived and the type of work he did. He is not in our country, but had indicated that he would be traveling for work to near us shortly, and they had made some plans to meet. And when she got some red flags and backed out, the dude threatened to publish these pictures online. I am, incidentally, an attorney. So, some searching later, and gathering up any pictures he sent her of him, that could possibly identify him, his online handle led me to a TikTok page, which lead me to an Instagram page with his name on it. That lead to a LinkedIn page with his place of work that matched a picture he sent with a branded polo he was wearing. Some more searched got me the email of the CEO, VP of HR, Operations Manager, and Public Relations Manager. I just fired off an email on behalf of my client of the screenshots of him threatening revenge porn, snippets of the conversation showing that username while he sent that exact picture of him wearing his company's branded apparel, links to how I know it's him, along with pictures he sent her of his motorcycle with the license plate showing, as further proof it is him. I also included screenshots of him discussing a workplace incident that were time-stamped, along with pieces of dialogue discussing how he had sex with an ex at his place of work, and discussing plans to have sex with her in his office as well. I also included a picture he sent her showing his work laptop with his entire Outlook calendar, along with proprietary information, which he sent to prove he was busy, along with other pictures he took of his workplace with non-consenting employees. I further informed his employer that I will be forwarding all this information to local, to them, law enforcement and since he had indicated that he would be traveling to the United States soon, will also forward this to the local office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation as, since my client is a US citizen on US soil, these threats constituted a federal crime. So that should they continue with his employment and continue with their plans to send him to the United States for work, I will ensure on behalf of my client that federal law enforcement is waiting for him on arrival. Which I will do, as one of the assistant U.S. attorneys for this region is a law school buddy of mine. 
Since I have his license plate hashtag I know where he lives, and will be contacting his local authorities tomorrow. You dumb motherfucker thinking you were hiding around anonymity, thinking you could threaten my friend? It took me 45 minutes to destroy your life. Story 401k with a side of revenge. Someone suggested I post this story over here, enjoy. When our first child was born, my ex forced me to quit my job. When our second child was two, I found out about his affair. By then he was extremely verbally, emotionally, and sometimes physically abusive. When he abused our firstborn, I put him out. That was in 2012. I couldn't afford daycare to work and had no family support. He refused to give me any money to take care of the kids saying, The courts haven't ordered me to give you a dime. He lied to the bank and had my accounts frozen and even assaulted me when I filed for default in the divorce. The judge finally ordered him to pay child and spousal support six months after I kicked him out. It was 2,562 a month. He refused to pay it until the garnishment kicked in and by then he was 6k behind in support. I used that to get permission to move away. I remarried a year after the divorce. I checked the court docs and there was a little box that said spousal support stopped upon remarriage if that box was checked. It wasn't checked, so I figured I was good. Instead of filing for his retirement, I just took that year of spousal support 12k and left it alone. Spousal support was only ordered for two years in 2017, he filed for sole custody of the kids out of nowhere. That was when he found out I had remarried and he had paid spousal support to me during the first year of my marriage. I told him I took that money instead of filing for my share of his retirement. I said if he let me keep that 12k, I wouldn't file to split his 401k. He demanded that I repay the spousal support. The judge ordered me to repay it but increased child support and deducted the repayment from that. It ended up that I got an extra 20.00 a month and he repaid himself. He dropped his bid for custody in exchange for two extra weeks in summer. I pursued the retirement account split. He refused to cooperate and dragged it out for four years. It was so bad, they sanctioned him and he had to pay me 600 a month for a year in addition to child support. They also charged him with contempt. In January 2021, he proposed to his girlfriend. In May of 2021, I finally got the disbursement from his 401k. I won't say how much it was, but it was about four times the amount of spousal support overpayment. I had no idea it would be that much. I had thought it would be around 12k which is why I thought keeping that year of spousal and not filing for his retirement account was a fair trade. Had he not tried to take the kids from me, I never would have filed to split the account. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. His fiancé emailed me recently and told me it is my fault he won't marry her because I cleaned out his retirement account. She said I shouldn't have stolen his money. I told her that I gave him the option to let me keep that year of spousal support or take it back and I could file for his retirement. He chose to have me file for his retirement. I told her that if he really wanted to marry her and protect his assets, they could get a prenup so he wouldn't have to worry about it. She said she shouldn't have to sign a prenup because I robbed him. I never asked to be financially dependent on him. He clearly indicated he wanted a court order to take care of his kids so I got him one. I tried to be fair and take the lesser amount by taking the spousal support and not filing for his retirement. He wouldn't let me. In summary, my ex refused to pay me until support orders dropped, refused to pay until they revoked his license. Tried to get me in trouble for accepting spousal support over payment and in the end it cost him a lot of money out of his 401k. Story, not going to pay overtime. Think again. I was discussing this sub with a good friend, and he said, boy, have I got a story that'll fit. It wasn't his story, but his brother's, and I sat with him and got the details. Buckle up, it's a good one and a long one. Let's call him Bob. Bob has been fiddling with computers since he was a kid and knows them pretty well. As with most IT people, he's moved from job to job. 
The employer he worked for was a service distribution company, and there were two IT employees. The company was located in Ontario, Canada. About three years ago, Bob's employer decided to modernize their software. They had separate programs for dispatching, for inventory, for payroll and finances, and it was complicated moving information from one program to the other. They decided to get an ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Program, and Bob recommended one that he knew inside out from a previous employer. For those of you who don't know, an ERP program handles everything. Purchase orders. Sales. Inventory. Personnel. Vendors. Customers. All of it. You can run a report and find out which customer has bought the most part ABC in the last year. Which salesman has improved his numbers the most? Which vendor has the fastest delivery time? Which shipper packed the most orders? Everyone in the company used the ERP program, but it was very complicated, and they used the aspects of it that related to their position. For example, the receiver would accept a shipment, verify the quantity, confirm it was received and the inventory stats would be available to the salespeople if they wanted to look up how many were on hand. The receiver didn't care what the price was, or who the vendor was, he just did his job. Bob was run ragged during the implementation process, but he managed to train most of the employees on their aspects, and after a few months, everything was running fairly smoothly. Bob still got tickets for tweaks in the operation of the software, and occasional hardware IT issues. Then the company decided to expand their footprint and was marketing into different time zones. That messed things up. Atlantic Canada is 90 minutes early, so if someone sent an email or an order at 8 a.m. their time, it would arrive at 6.30 a.m. Ontario time. Pacific Canada is 3 hours late, so an email sent at 3 p.m. Vancouver time would arrive at 6 p.m. This stretched out the day, so many staff came in early and worked late. Bob would arrive at 8 a.m. and there would be people that demanded his immediate assistance, and were annoyed that he didn't respond instantly, even though their request was submitted before his start time. Same with late in the day his phone would ring at dinner time with people that wanted help right now. They decided to stagger his and his IT colleagues' shift times, Bob would start at 6 a.m. and work till 2.30, and his colleague would start at 10.30 a.m. and work till 7 p.m. Bob's colleague had kids and refused the shift change. The employer insisted. The colleague quit. That meant that Bob was the only person in the IT department. The employer said they would look to hire a new IT guy, but they had trouble finding one that knew the ERP system and they were offering well under a market value salary. Bob asked for a raise and was denied. Then he wanted overtime, and the employer told him that as an IT specialist, he was exempt from overtime laws in Ontario. Bob looked it up, and the employer was correct. This went on for some time, and he knew lots of IT people socially. They told him what the company was offering, and Bob knew that they wouldn't find another tech. Things went downhill from there. Bob would get chewed out if he missed a call or an email, no matter what time it came in. He had to train new hires in the ERP system, as well as take care of the hardware. He asked repeatedly for better compensation, and was denied so he planned to get a new job. Now here's the revenge. Bob had access to the entirety of the ERP program. When a user signed in, the time was logged, and even if they didn't sign out, after 15 minutes it would log them out anyway. Everyone in the company was on salary, and many of them came in early and stayed late. Ontario labor law states that even salaried workers are entitled to overtime after 44 hours a week, unless they were managers or supervisors. So Bob jumped into the program and ran a report for each employee that wasn't a manager. All the way back to when the ERP program was started. Then he reached out to an employment lawyer and got the OK to refer employees to him. Bob lined up another job, and after he left, every employee in the company got an email with an Excel sheet showing the hours they had put in past 44 hours a week. The subject line said you're legally entitled to overtime pay in the body of the email was the lawyer's name. The shit hit the fan. 
Almost every employee authorized the lawyer to negotiate with the company on their behalf, and the company had to pay a ton of money. All the company had to do was pay Bob for the extra work he put in. Instead, they had to pay almost everyone. Story, I ruined my ex-boyfriend's life 20 plus years ago, and I just made sure it stayed ruined. When I was in college in the 90s, I met Jake then M23 through mutual friends. He had already graduated and was planning to move to the opposite side of the United States for grad school and I had already been making plans to move with friends only a 90-minute drive away from where he was moving to. We had so much in common, fell in love and it really seemed like fate, both planning to move 3,000 miles and landing so close together. He had two sisters and a younger brother who were all awesome people and I became instant friends with them as well. Because he was in school and I was working, I would usually go to him to hang out on weekends. He was renting a house with two roommates, also in his program. We were young so money was tight but we had fun, went for taco dates and spent a lot of time at his house where he was breeding and selling small animals. Jake was an animal sciences PhD student so being around animals was normal and I loved it. I met and became friends with his advisor's wife Mary, mid-fifties, who worked in administration at the university. She is a lovely woman and I would often have lunch with her when I went over on weekends. Jake was a teaching assistant and I met other people in the program and made friends with them faster than he did. After about two years of dating, I was at the house one day, laying in bed together, in a state of some undress and he said out of the blue, he was concerned I'd been gaining weight and it made it harder for him to be attracted to me. No concern about my health, it was all about him finding me unattractive. I sat up and said, well, then maybe you should make sure there is better food for me to eat than crackers and cheese when I come up on weekends. Even at 23, I didn't take that kind of Bachelor of Science. I had gained maybe 10 pounds since meeting him two years earlier and still wore the same size clothes about a US size 6 to 8. I wasn't going to engage in a fight about it after all, it was his problem, not mine, so I asked him calmly, so what is your solution to this? He stared at me blankly and said well, I guess that you should try to lose weight and I said, nah, I'm not going to do that so what are you going to do about it? He said, well, I guess nothing, I wanted to let you know how I feel and I said, cool, thank you, put my clothes back on, went to sleep and drove home the next day as usual. We keep dating and about three months later he called me and said he wanted to break up after close to three years. The reason and I quote you don't know enough about science. He felt like he couldn't have a conversation with me about his work where he didn't have to use common names for animals instead of scientific ones. I said, well, that's bullshit, what's the real reason? He said it was the real reason. He came to see me a month later to return something of mine and I confronted him, demanding the real reason. He finally admitted he had been seeing one of his undergrad students, let's call her Meg, a 19-year-old. He was then 26 and her teacher. I screamed at him to leave, my roommate threatened to throw him off our second floor balcony if he didn't go and he left. It hit me all at once after he walked out and I went from rage to stunned laughter. I'd met Meg a few times and at one point, she was at his house for a barbecue and spilled something all over her pants. Jake asked me if I could loan her some sweats. I couldn't because I was a size 8 and she was a size 18. Nothing wrong with that, at all, but the point is, I realized he made those comments about my weight to try and get me to break up with him because he was a coward. He clearly liked a big gal. Although, when he'd said those things to me about my weight it was 1 a.m., I lived about 95 miles away and we had just had sex so I don't know how he thought this would go, even in hindsight, it perplexes me. Did he think I was going to break up with him and storm off into the night and drive for an hour and a half? Anyway, I emailed his roommates, it was the early 2000s, it's how you communicated anything you didn't want to say on the phone. I wanted to let them know we'd broken up and that they were always lovely to me and thank them for being friends. They both admitted they knew about Meg and were the ones to demand that Jake tell me or they would. That's when he broke up with me with the lame, you don't understand science excuse. One of his roommate, a super nice, super cute guy named George offered to help me get a few things still at their house that he had collected for me away from around the house. 
He suggested I come up for the weekend, we go out and drink and have a good time, all the things Jake didn't want to waste money on and I said sure. So I went up and George let me into the house while Jake was gone. I took photos of all of his animals because while I might not be a student, I paid attention and I knew he had an endangered species in his care. He wasn't breeding it, it was an unreleasable animal he had taken in from a rescue organization. There was paperwork he had to submit with a $25 fee and he refused to do it, saying he didn't want the government in his business. I took photos of that animal, all his breeding conditions and a photo of an animal not allowed in the state which was in a tank, right next to a window and visible from outside. I then went out for a night on the town with George. We stumbled in early, around midnight so Jake and Meg who were watching TV would see me in a short dress, drunk and George practically carrying me. I spent the night in George's room. He was a total gentleman but made sure to leave the room and parade past them in his boxers a few times and we giggled and moaned loudly so they could hear us. When I went to leave the next morning, Jake said I didn't have to act like a whore in front of him as I ate a donut slowly in my rumbled dress with messy hair while George beamed at me and then planted a kiss on my head. Meg looked ashamed, not quite knowing where to look and I said have fun with my leftovers and walked out. I wanted to think the petty, loud, hook up and a few juvenile insults was my revenge. It was not. The next day I had my photos developed ah, uh, the good old days and called the state office of fish and wildlife. I reported the animals in the house, the potential overcrowding of breeding animals and the two animals he shouldn't legally have it all in the state and asked them how to make a report. Turns out Jake wasn't well liked by his peers in his program or by his roommates but I was. George had suggested that he and their other roommate could submit complaints to the university that a teaching assistant was sleeping with one of his students and showing her favoritism. The night we were out at the bars, we made sure to tell the story to anyone who they knew. They made sure all the women in his classes knew he was sleeping with Meg. It wasn't a large program so people knew fast he had cheated and was now dating his student. George and the other roommate made sure people knew they had put in complaints, sick of Jake's entitled Bachelor of Science. With my full statement made in photos sent to the state wildlife officials, I called my friend Mary, Jake's advisor's wife. She knew about the breakup and lame reason and I let her know he admitted he was sleeping with a student. I'd been emailing with him and he admitted to it in writing so I sent that to Mary. To say she was not happy about that was an understatement. She said she made sure it would be investigated and told her husband, Jake's direct advisor, while I was on the phone with her. Speaking of investigations, a few weeks later George called me, giddy, to say state fish and wildlife officials were there, confiscating animals. He told them he would be happy to tell them whatever they needed to know. Meg was there when it happened and told the officials as far as she knew, all the animals belonged to her boyfriend Jake and that they were all legal. That put George and the other roommate in the clear. One animal was kept in the backyard so it was implied to Jake that a neighbor reported it. While they were there to investigate, they knew to look in the back window to see the far more problematic, illegal to have in the state under nearly any circumstances, animal. Since George was on the lease, he was able to let them in to investigate in the house. The animals were all in communal areas and the officers stayed there for a few hours and returned with a warrant to take all the animals and enter Jake's room to investigate. George and the other roommate let them into their rooms with no issues and were quickly cleared. Meg apparently couldn't get a hold of Jake and eventually drove to the university to find him. Remember, no cell phones yet. It was a good day. The only animals they left was some guppies in a fish tank. Now, students need grant money to do research and a large part of animal studies funding comes from the federal government. Jake had just gotten an icosapentinoic accident right around when he broke up with me. So I called the icosapentinoic accident and asked how I would report that a person with a federal grant was being investigated for illegally harboring endangered animals. Long story short, he lost his icosapentinoic accident grant and had to make restitution on what had already been used close to $30,000. He would never be able to get another federal grant. He avoided jail time on the state charges since all the animals were in good health 
but lost all his breeding animals worth thousands of dollars since they were collected for safekeeping during the investigation when the two illegal animals were taken. In the end, he owed a $15,000 fine and the two animals went to a nearby nature center. For years, I would stop by if I was in the area to visit them. The university revoked his with a student. He somehow escaped being expelled, but it always shocked me that he never tried to hide the relationship with Meg and was so stupidly self-assured he didn't even wait the four weeks until she would have been done with his class to start publicly dating her. By the university rules, he would have been in the clear to date her, not being her teacher anymore and she would just have to avoid any classes he was a teaching assistant in. It never fails to make me laugh. After a few months, I emailed his sisters and told them I missed them because Jake broke up with me after trying to call me fat and cheating on me and I felt weird contacting them. The girls told me he told the family I broke up with him because of the distance. I forwarded them emails that Jake wrote after the breakup, talking about how he fell for Meg and he was sorry about it but it was true, I couldn't keep up with him academically and it made him attracted to Meg. Jake managed to convince his dad to pay for one more year of school so he could get a master's instead of A and while I stayed in contact with his sisters and brother via email and then social media, I largely let it all go. I got even, made some friends, Mary became like an auntie to me and I went on with life. I went on to get a master's degree myself and my specialty. Helping scientists and doctors communicate their work to lay people. You know, us dummies who can't remember all the scientific names. I swear, it happened by accident, not design, but I love it and I work with everyone from small town doctors and nurses to pharmaceutical companies to museums to state and federal governments to film and TV producers. I travel a lot and speak and get to learn a lot of cool things about our planet and how things work. I knew through his siblings that Jake and Meg got married and had two kids. Meg dropped out of the sciences and became an accountant, Jake went back to breeding animals. Every once in a while, his sisters or brother would tell me something over for lunch or via text, but we had our own relationship that exists outside of him. Apparently when I sent a wedding gift for one of his sisters he loudly complained at a co-ed bridal shower that all of his siblings still were my friend and didn't make an effort to embrace his now wife, Meg. Apparently the sister just laughed and said, I don't make it a habit to be friends with homewreckers. This is how Jake's parents found out how their relationship started and ours ended, ten years after we broke up. Jake never found out I was behind reporting him to the state and in the end, I didn't lie about a single thing, except maybe exaggerating a drunken make-out session with George who is now a successful and tenured professor with a lovely wife and daughters. Fast forward about 20 years to a few weeks ago. I was at a university giving a lecture to a room of 250 undergrad and grad students. In the end, I was mingling with the student afterwards and I hear a voice say, hey long time no see and I realize it's Jake and I didn't change the expression on my face at all. I was completely shocked and my instinct was to play dumb. So I said, I'm sorry, help me out, have we met at another workshop or lecture? He looked incredulous and said, it's me Jake and I said, I can't place you but I would love to figure it out. Finally I gasped and said, oh my goodness, Jake. I guess I blocked you out and said, well, lovely to see you and moved on quickly when he tried to reach out and hug me. I was happy to leave it there, with the satisfaction of him seeing me as a guest lecturer in a science department of a major university when he was just in the audience. The department chair and faculty who had invited me to speak took me out to dinner and while there, one of them said, so you know Jake. I said, I did from over 20 years ago, being vague about how. She went on to tell me he had been there for an interview for a teaching position and had spent a few days there observing and they were likely going to hire him. I couldn't control it, I scoffed. When they all looked at me I said, I'm sorry, I'm just shocked he's teaching after what happened at University X. They said what happened and I said, he was sleeping with a 19-year-old student when he was 26 and he had to leave the program without a because he couldn't afford to stay after losing his scholarship. The three people I was with all looked at each other like they knew they had a problem and said, wow, we'll have to look into that and change the subject.
My old friend Mary retired a year or two now, but still friendly with her old collages called me this weekend to say a friend at the university let her know someone had called doing a background check about Jake and they pulled his file which included being fired, leaving the program with a lower degree and the complete letters from over 20 years ago about his conduct. Mary's name had been on it with her husband listed as the so she thought she'd like to know. As a bonus, it had a copy of his arrest record for the illegal animals. I guess his dad had paid for a decent lawyer to get the record expunged after the charges were reduced and he paid the fine so it doesn't show up on a standard background check. I don't think he's going to get that job. So I will return to my life, content that the universe comes through sometimes, especially if you give it a little nudge now and then. The best revenge is when you don't have to do anything wrong, you just have to help direct knowledge to the right places. If there is anything I can impart to any young women and men reading this, as I shimmy happily into my now size 10 pants, it's that, if someone who is supposed to love you complains about your weight or looks, that is their problem to fix mentally, not yours and maybe it's time to check out what they are doing behind your back or simply move on. Remember though, it is their flaw, not yours. If Jake hadn't been a coward and tried to make me break up with him and just ended things with me in a mature way, I might not have found out about Meg and turned his own wickedness back on himself. Story, try and get my team member fired, get deported. I am not sure if this is pro-revenge, so I will let you all decide, if not let me know and I will move it. I will say in advance sorry for the long one, but the backstory is relevant. Back in the early 2010s I started working for a big internet-based company in the UK. The company was opening a new office with a new subdivision in London. When I started there were two team leaders and the office manager. The two teams were the content team and the SEO search engine optimization team. I was recruited to be the development team lead that is web development. When I was interviewed for the job, both the office manager and SEO team lead were carrying out the interview. As you do in interviews when they asked if this or that could be done I would respond yes of course or you know you would get a better result doing X, Y or Z. So, I got offered the job and for the first year there was so much going on. As well as building a team, I also had a portfolio of websites that needed to be redeveloped and redesigned. It was at this point that some red flags started to pop up. I would have the SEO team lead we will call him Andy coming to me and telling me that I needed to do things the way he wanted. I would always push back and say no, and give a reason why I was doing things the way I was. Andy would get irate and would complain to the office manager about me. When the office manager would ask me about it I would explain what had happened and why I had said no and the office manager would leave it there because at the end of the day I was the one with the experience in web development, not Andy. This happened a few times over the first year and I then realized that the reason that Andy was getting so irate was because he thought that I would be a yes man to him. Sorry buddy, that is not who I am. So, now that we have the backstory let's get into what lead to the revenge. Me and the team had been working hard to get two of the new websites completed, and I was due to show them off to the board before they went live. This company's head office was in another part of the country and I had to leave the office in London at about lunchtime. So, I arrived to the hotel that is across the road from the head office about 4 p.m. and jump on my laptop to start going through the sites to run some tests. I was testing functionality, making sure the look and feel were correct, things like that. Then it happened, we found a major bug that caused a major issue with the functionality of the website. So it is at this point that I am going to introduce the star of our story, Johnny not real name, but attacked all the same who was my senior developer. Me and Johnny working through the night, me in the hotel room and him in the London office. We finally fixed the bug, about 7 a.m. the following day. My meeting with the board was at 10 a.m., so after getting showered, the feed, and over to the office I started my day with zero hours sleep. I go into the meeting and the first thing that is said, is the CEO asking if I was okay I had met him a few times and he was a really nice guy. I explained that we had found an issue with the sites yesterday and me and Johnny had worked through the night to fix it before the meeting. Long story short everyone was really impressed and loved the new sites. 
At the end of the meeting the CEO pulled me aside and thanked me for everything and then told me to go home and get some sleep it was about a three-hour train ride to London and then another hour home. I thanked him and went on my way. So, after taking my team out for a well-deserved lunch to say thank you, the office manager then organized a night out for the whole office to celebrate on the following Friday. We started off at a fancy bar not my sort of thing. I am a man of cheap tastes and then everyone moves on to a small club. I go to the club for a bit, but then leave quite early in the night as I need to get a train home. I say my byes and then head home. I come into the office on the Monday and there is something going on. I speak with Emma. Not real name, the content team's lead. She does not know what is going on, but there are people from head office, HR, and others. Then a few minutes later all the team leaders are called into a meeting. We are all squished in one of the small meeting rooms, there is office manager, two members of the HR team from head office and the three team leaders including myself. So, HR explained that there has been a complaint made against Johnny. A member of the SEO team we will call him Mark had called Andy on the Friday saying that Johnny had been making racist comments while everyone was out at the club. Both myself and Emma were taken aback, this was not like Johnny. On a side note, I felt that I need to explain the races of people involved. This is just for context and not an attack on anyone involved. Johnny, Emma and I are white British. Andy is African born in Britain, I believe, and Mark is Indian once again I believe. So, the whole day was spent with HR doing interviews with the other people that were there that night and we then all reconvened towards the end of the day. The result of the interviews were that no one had heard anything like what Mark was saying. So, it was Mark's word against Johnny's, this was not acceptable for Andy. He wanted Johnny fired and cried we could not have someone like that in the office. So, both Emma and I looked at each other and though that it was strange that he was so instant on firing Johnny with no evidence. Both the office manager and HR agreed, and Johnny was let off with a warning and to be aware in the future of how things he says that could be misinterpreted. Life went back to normal in the office, that is until about two months later. The story of what had happened had gone round the office about twelve people. Then one afternoon, I was pulled aside by one of the guys on the content team and he said that he had overheard Andy and Mark talking and thought I should know. We went into one of the meeting rooms and he laid everything out. What I heard made my blood boil and I think had I been in a cartoon steam would have been erupting from my ears. He told me that the racism complaint was faked and a plan that Andy had to attack my team because I would not bend to his demands. Him and Mark we on a call outside the club Andy was not there that night and that is when he heard what they were doing. It later came out that their plan was to make the complaint against Johnny and get him fired which would then lead on to Andy complaining that I was not fit to run a team if I let that sort of this happen under my leadership. My first question was why he didn't bring this up with HR in the interviews, he said that he did but it was his word against both Andy and Mark. I thanked him for this and went on with what I was doing. I was pissed. There was no way that I was going to let the slide, but I knew that if I was going to go after them, I needed to have everything in place beforehand. I didn't tell Johnny what I had been told and asked the guy that told me to keep it to himself for now. I didn't want Johnny to get pissed off and do something that would get him fired or worse affect any revenge I could dish out. So, I watched. I watched everything the SEO team did and didn't do. Then it happened, it was like Engels had descended from heaven to deliver me the winning lottery ticket. The building we were in was a three-story building with a main stairwell with a door on each floor to the offices. The stairwell also lead to a door out to the street. At the time I was a casual smoker and used it to get a break from the screen and clear my head if something I was working on was not going well. So, I walk out of the door to the office and into the stairwell and who is there? Mark of all people. He is on the phone, and he goes white as a sheet when he sees me. Now he is mid-sentence with the person on the other end of the phone, and as I am walking past, he is forced to carry on the conversation. I overhear, and from what he is saying I can tell that he is talking to a school or something like that. The conversation sounding like he was looking for information about applying and about a visa. 
I thought that was a strange call to be having and something was fishy about it. I had my suspicions as to what was going on, but nothing concrete at this time. A few days later I was heading back up to the head office and by that time we had a new office manager who lived near the head office so was based there most of the time. When I got there, I dropped my things off at the hotel and headed over to the office. I went to his desk and asked to have a quick chat. I explained to him what I had overheard Mark talking about on the phone and said that maybe the company might like to look at his visa status. So, a week went by and nothing seemed to happen, then bam. He stopped showing up to the office. A few days later I got told what had happened from one of the other SEO team members. Mark had been fired with immediate effect for no longer having the correct visa to work in the UK the company did not want to get involved in sponsoring a new visa for him, I don't know why. I started asking questions around the office random chit chat and I found out that Mark is from Dubai and he was here on his wife's student visa I don't know how that works, but it was all above board. I also found out that his wife's course had finished and that left them with a small window of time to get a new visa. That is when it all clicked. Now there are some doggy people in London and everywhere else and they would set up these fake collages that would sign people up to get visas to live and work in to UK. At some point before or after this saw a program on this and normally these were set up in tiny offices that you couldn't swing a cat and let alone be a collage. They were us ed as postal addressed for the collage and they would charge a course fee to be enrolled and thus be able to apply for a student visa. So, what Mark was trying to do is to get enrolled in one of these collages so that he could stay in the UK and carry on working. I found out a few weeks later that Mark and his wife did have to leave the UK and go back to Dubai because he didn't have any money coming in to pay for his new collage course. By Mark. When I found out that Mark had been let go, I pulled Johnny aside and filled him in on everything. He could not believe it and was stunned that they would try and do that. I apologized to him as it was my fault that he had been targeted by them in a way to get at me. He would not accept it and said that I had gone above and beyond in defending him. Following on from this I made it quite clear to Andy that I know what he and Mark had done, and I would not be forgetting it and to watch his back I made sure we were not in earshot of anyone else. About two months later Andy handed in his notice and left the company, never to be seen or heard from again. I have told this story to some people over the years, and I have been asked so many times if I feel guilty for what I did. I always respond the same way, I feel guilty that Johnny was wrongfully accused and targeted. I don't feel guilty about what I did to Mark. You don't mess with my friends, family, or team. Bye and see you again in the next videos and stories.